right? Ah, well, aloha mai nā hoa, maka maka mai kumo kupuni nui o ki awea hiki i ni ihau kele lani. Aloha kāko, um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming, this is an awesome spot. <laughs> was definitely driving up the gravel road and like, I'm not in the right place. But, <laughs> you know, and then you get out here and it's like, oh my God, no, beautiful facility, wonderful job, you guys have... Um, really progressed <laughs> over the years the waikoloa dry forest initiative um they didn't have this 20 years ago when uh jen and i met at amy grimo <laughs> um so yeah i think before i get going uh i just want to mention um you know in jen's introduction i think really talked about my main hat which is um you know academic and research and really kind of situated in, in um, you know, understanding our past and bringing, bringing those concepts forward. Um, but the purpose of that, right, is not to create museum pieces or like, you, you know, kind of stuff. Like, you know, how do we really instill that and bring it back into practice? And so, um, you know, the other half of my work really is around, um, especially agriculture, you know, how do we improve agricultural practices? Um, uh, me and my wife founded the Hawaii Ulu Producers Cooperative that she now manages. And, you know, just thinking about, you know, the social structures and the environmental knowledge and practices and, and how do we, um, you know, given that everything's so different, right? I mean, the, the social structure we have today is different. The environment we have today is different. Like the technology we have today is different. But what is the relevance of this traditional knowledge and how do we, you know, bring it forward? Um, not saying that we want to go back to the past, you know, it's not a back to the future thing, but it's, you know, how do we, um, use that to improve our trajectory and, and think about what we're doing and, and, you know, shift our direction a little bit, because I think it's pretty clear at a global level, we're not on the best, um, course right now. Right. And we really do need to change track. And so, um, you know, what I'm talking about tonight is very grounded in the past and it's very kind of, you know, grounded in, in, you know, theoretical concepts of, of what our ancestors were doing doing. Um, but, you know, we don't want to stop there, right? We're always thinking about, okay, well, then what does that mean for our contemporary situation? And not in an idyllic way, but in a very concrete way. What does that mean in how we should allocate zoning in our county? What does that mean in the way we should, you know, enact laws and restrictions on agricultural lands? You know, so um, just want to preface that because it is kind of a, a academic and theoretic, you know, stuff that we're going through tonight. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that. I'm also a very informal speaker uh, for those of you who haven't seen me before. Um, and so please, if we um, go along this path, this journey together tonight, if there is any questions or thoughts or anything that anyone has, like, don't feel like you need to wait to the end. You know, I'm happy to kind of depart from the narrative as we go along and go off on tangents. And so, you know, anything that pricks your interest or curiosity, you know, we're happy to entertain those thoughts uh, as we go through. Um, so my title is uh, the Ancient Hawaiian Agroforestry Footprint. All right. So I always like to start um, with some Olelo no Iao. Um, I do use this one a lot. He li'i no ka'aina he kawa vale ke kanaka. You know, the land is chief and the people are merely servants. Um, and there's a lot of ways we can think about that, you know. Um, uh, but in, in the concept of tonight's talk, um, I think an important one is um, uh, really around environmental opportunities and limitations, right? That we literally just cannot do whatever we want on the landscape because there are hard limitations to what that land offers us. And, you know, kind of like the kapu system, you know, some of those are really rigid, <laughs> right? If there's only so much fresh water, there's only so many ways we can allocate that, right? Like that land is dictating at a large scale on, on what we're able to do. And um, as we'll talk about briefly, um, you know, Hawaii is one of the best places in the world to look at how 
um, really diverse ecosystems influenced human behavior and activity. And I think in the conservation world, we are very, very quick to acknowledge the um, amazing diversity of Hawaii. You know, in the conservation world, nobody questions that Hawaii is among the most ecologically dense and ecologically diverse locations on the planet. You know, when you look at, at, at um, uh, you know, our rainfall gradients and the differences in our lava flow ages and the substrates and the elevations, you know, you have two thirds of the Holdridge life zones, right, on Hawaii Island alone. And that is, is common knowledge and, and very uh, um, acknowledged in the conservation world. And because of that ecological diversity, right, diversity drives diversity. So when you look at our uh, biological diversity, because our ecological diversity is amazing, our biological diversity was amazing, right? And the, you know, Darwin's finches, right? The, the top shelf example of adaptive radiation, Hawaii blows that out of the water, right? Like on an order of threefold, you know, the adaptive radiation of the finches in Hawaii were, were three times that of the speciation of, of the Galapagos. What do you mean by adaptive radiation? Um, so basically, right, something, something comes here and it is what it is. Um, no, that, well, yeah, yes, radius is the right word, right? So radius indicating distance from a central point. So you imagine the first finch gets to Hawaii and maybe let's just say it was a, a new, not New England, uh, let's say, you know, it was a, a Northern Californian finch. Right. And maybe Waikiki area is the appropriate habitat for that northern Californian finch. So when he gets here, he finds Waikiki and he goes, oh, this is my home. I love it here. This is great. And he goes there and they start developing and, and reproducing and spreading out. But as you spread out from Waikiki, right, that's only... 10 miles away as the crow flies, right? And it's cold and it's foggy and it's misty and it's like that, you know, coastal range, Northern California habitat. So as that population of finches spread out and got here to Waikoloa, they had to completely adapt. They became an entirely new species. And so that's the concept of adaptive radiation that as a, a species spreads out from its initial habitat and gets into new habitats, it has to evolve. And as it evolves over time, it totally becomes a completely separate species. And so in the conservation world, that's really, really well um, uh, acknowledged. Um, but what I think is less acknowledged is that um, the same holds true for humans, that that concept of adaptive radiation and co-evolution to the ecological diversity holds true for people. Not in the sense that we, well, at a global sense, it's almost like we were speciating, right? Like people look very different. They're different heights, they're different tones, they're different builds, they're, you know, um, you know, adapted to different foods um, to some degree. Um, but the cultural adaptation to our different environments in Hawaii is, is really, really stark. It's very, very um, observable as it's not observable in many places of the world um, because of our ecological diversity, right? Like as, as humans came here, right? Maybe they came from Tahiti and Tahiti is a very wet, you know, lots of big rivers, um, steep cliffs, right? And so they come to Hawaii and they, you know, canoe around the island and they're like, oh man, Waipio, that reminds me of home. This is where we're going to settle. And so the first Hawaiians might have settled in Waipio because it reminded them of, of Tahiti or Marquesas or Samoa, wherever they came from. But over time, right, they reproduce, they spread out, and eventually they get to someplace like here, like Waikoloa. There is no place in Tahiti <laughs> that is like Waikoloa. You know, the, the, the driest place on Tahiti is something like 3,000 millimeters of rain a year, you know, like as, as wet as Hilo. You know, that's the driest they get. And so as these, the, our, our ancestors spread out and colonized this landscape, 
they had to culturally and in their practices adapt to entirely different environments, um, just like the finch did. Um, you know, we weren't here long enough to speciate. We didn't become a whole different species of humans, but we did adapt culturally and in our practices in really, really, I think, profound ways. And again, because Hawaii is, is one of the most ecologically diverse, ecologically dense places on the planet, um, we can really see that cultural adaptation here in ways that is almost impossible to observe uh, uh, anywhere else in the world. Oh boy, we're on the slow boat on this. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> keep it going. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is actually talking about that, right? The first va'a that got here, our ancestors weren't Hawaiian when they hopped off that canoe. You know, they, they became Hawaiian um, by interacting with landscapes, uh, evolving their practices, their protocols, their norms to entirely new landscapes um, and developing new systems. Um, so... Um, you know, just really quickly, you know, we already talked about it, but the driving force of Hawaii's ecosystem diversity, right, is that we have an amazing age gradient of our volcanoes, and you can sequentially hop up the island chain and go from brand new, right, still cooling lava in, in the southeast of uh, uh, Hawaii Island, all the way up to five million year old soils on Ni'ihau, and you just have this beautiful age gradient, and on top of that, we have some of the most impressive rainfall gradients in the world. You know, um, north of Kauai High is classified as a true desert. You know, less than 150 millimeters of rain a year. You know, it's a desert classification. And in the span of about three hours, if you're a, a fast hiker, um, you can walk the nine mile span to the summit of Kohala and be in one of the wettest locations in the planet. There's nowhere else in the world you can walk from a desert to one of the wettest places in the world in three hours. Like that diversity is amazing and, and we need to uh, acknowledge and give tribute to that all the time. Um, because yeah, it's, it's so unique. Um, those, con that, those, those two primary factors of age and rainfall, they interact to form secondary differences. So for instance, the topography of our landscape, how smooth the landscape is or how dissected it is with valleys is a function of age and rainfall. And you can predict that really, really well. Um, similar, similarly, our, our diversity of soils. Um, they're also a function of age and rainfall. And you can predict what soil type you're going to be on if you know how old your substrate is and how much rainfall you have. Um, so all these secondary factors, again, cause all these different ecosystems. We're amazing. Um, like I said, yeah, woo! <laughs> um, like I said, our ancestors adapt to that ecological diversity particularly observable in their agriculture. Um, so don't expect you to be able to read all of this, but the bottom line is that we had a tremendous diversity of agro ecosystems. And what our ancestors, how our ancestors decided to grow their food on the landscape was largely a function of the ecology. Um, just like, right, we define a dry forest as having a certain ecology, right, a wet forest having a certain ecology, the same held true for the cultural adaptation. You know, a certain ecosystem provided certain opportunities and certain constraints. And because of that, a certain form of agriculture tended to develop uh, in those ecosystems. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that. So I think the main theme, theme was footprint tonight. And so just want to talk briefly about the genesis of it. Um, that um, initial focus on Hawaiian agriculture has really focused on systems that um, one left a physical footprint 
you know, because all this work was done by archaeologists, and archaeologists like things, <laughs> right? They like stone structures, they like things that they can, you know, map and excavate, and, you know, there's a physical remain. And so the Lo'i systems, right, are flooded irrigated systems, our intensive dry land systems with the long Kua Ivi walls, like these became really well documented and studied, but um, in that process, they ignored a, a tremendous component of traditional ag that didn't leave a physical footprint. Um, so for instance, uh, on the left, this is uh, um, some initial uh, modeling of dry land and wetland systems by um, Thane Latifog who's a really good friend and colleague uh, down at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And um, he nailed it for the dry land and wetland systems, you know, produced these really accurate models um, because Hawaii is such a great model system. Um, you're able to, to do this. There's, there's not a lot of places in the world you could do this and then produce something that's like 80% accurate. Um, but he did. And, you know, so for the, the wetland and dry land systems, um, which he modeled, um, he did very well, but I couldn't help but look at this and I'm like, well, where's Hamakua, <laughs> right? Like, where's Puna? Where's these areas that we knew were major population centers, and yet they're kind of, of building this argument that, you know, um, in terms of quote unquote intensive agricultural production, <laughs> Um, there was really nothing in those areas. And we knew this wasn't true. Um, and um, so, you know, this was a, a kind of early generation, just hand drawn thing. I'm like, you know, from my experience and like, you know, digging into ethnography and, and historical literature and Hawaiian newspapers writings, you know, it should probably look more like the right than the left. Um, the left is correct, it's just missing a lot of things. What are the stars mean? Oh, I just stole this image from a, a paper we did um, talking about um, kind of really, well, um, restoration efforts of traditional ag. And um, so anyway, these were um, the partners on that paper, different locations around the island that are doing kind of traditional ag restoration um, and good places of learning and, and exposure and awareness. Um, so yeah, so on that paper was Hui Mao uh, in Kohala, uh, Ulumao Puanui uh, up in Kohala in the Kohala field system. Um, two efforts restoring the Kona field system, um, uh, Malama Kahalu'u and uh, uh, Maluaka, and then uh, my own farm, Malakalaulu, where we're restoring the traditional breadfruit belt um, of Kona as well. Um, yeah, good question, good observation, irrelevant to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so upon Thane's work, um, people have been building, you know, um, I think a lot of people recognize that Thane's work was a great start. Like our intensive dryland systems, our Lo'i systems were really important, but they weren't the whole story. Um, and so really good work by, by Natalie Kurashima, who I think either just talked or is talking next. Um, you know, she modeled colluvial slope agriculture, um, a very, a very um, uh, 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 niche habitat that's, that's caused by the rejuvenation of soil um, uh, fertility in our valleys. Um, and, you know, she showed, uh, especially on the older islands, that we missed a lot, or Thane missed a lot, right? And as you go on to Oahu, Molokai, uh, Kauai, you know, colluvial slope production became an extremely important part of the system. Um, and then uh, Sam Gaughan and others as well um, kind of also took Thane's model and then said, well, what about, you know, all the uh, archaeological evidence in terms of where people lived and, and worked and trails and this. And so they added a lot of these um, textural societal texture to these models as well. 
Um, but importantly, you know, in these estimates, um, the Hawaiian footprint, the total Hawaiian footprint on the landscape was still about, you know, nine to 15 percent of the landscape. Um, and so the work that we've really been doing is um, if you go anywhere else in Polynesia, any other island group in Polynesia, you know, Micronesia, you know, Pompeii, you know, Kosrai, if you go down to, you know, uh, uh, the Western Pacific of Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, Vanuatu, if you go South Pacific, you know, Tahiti, Marquesas, Cook Islands, everywhere you go, like agroforestry and arboriculture is the main form of agriculture they practice. Um, and the thing with arboriculture and agroforestry, it doesn't leave a physical footprint. The footprint is the tree. The tree is the infrastructure. You don't build walls. You don't build terraces. You don't excavate the land. The tree is the infrastructure. And there's tremendous evidence in Hawaii that our ancestors converted very large areas from native forests to um, productive forests. Um, you see that in the charcoal record, you know, so when you look at a, a long term emu pit, for instance, um, when you look at the really old stuff, it's all native hardwoods. It's Ohia, it's Mawa, it's, you know, um, the common, you know, trees that were available. And over time, that switches to be predominantly ulu, breadfruit, kukui, introduced trees that um, our ancestors brought with them. Um, and you also see it in the trees themselves. So we've been really pushing on using um, the footprint of our introduced Polynesian introduced trees to understand where our ancestors were doing agroforestry. Um, so our initial project was back in, in uh, well, I probably did the work in like 2012. Um, and then uh, we published in 2014. Um, but as part of my PhD, we really looked at the Kona field system and the distribution of ag there. And in particular, we spent a lot of time trying to understand there's a very famous breadfruit belt in Kona called the Kalu'ulu, um, which I've heard from a lot of elders is a contraction of Ka-ulu-ulu, which literally means the breadfruit grove. Um, but when you read the you know, European journals and, and our ancestors writing, um, essentially, uh, and you can see it drawn in this 1827 photo by one of the um, missionary's daughters, um, might be hard to see in this light, but um, right in the middle, that dark band, she literally draws all these, this narrow band of trees like stretching across the landscape. And the early European journals talk about this half mile wide, like breadfruit forest just in the middle of the landscape, um, stretching across um, about 18 miles long from Honau now in the south, all the way up to Kaulu Palehu in the north. Um, but we also ran up and down the mountain about 17 times. Mm -hmm. We did a fair bit of trespassing. <laughs> um, but um, we mapped all the, all the breadfruit trees we could find along these transects. Um, and we actually found that the breadfruit trees did align very well with a, a narrow band of, of breadfruit across the way. Um, and they also aligned with the old maps. Um, and so it was kind of our first indication that, hey, these trees haven't moved that much. Um, and although they're not, you know, hey, trees can move. Trees can move fast. You guys deal with invasive species, right? <laughs> I mean, a new invasive species gets somewhere, right? It can be over the whole island in a few years. And actually, a lot of people were very resistant to this method, at least in academia, because they're like, you can't use trees as an indicator from 200 years ago. Trees spread out, they reproduce, they move, right? And so this was not an accepted method when I started. Um, it sounds obvious, oh, the trees are still where they are, but, um, but it wasn't obvious from an academic perspective. Um, so, yes. I'm sorry, excuse me, but those blue lines there, are those contours, are they central lines? 
Yeah, the blue the blue lines are the uh, rainfall contours. Rainfall. Yeah, that's a good observation. And actually, if you look, the shape of that breadfruit belt follows the rainfall contour really quite well, uh, especially along its lower border. Um, so really said that our ancestors were cultivating breadfruit, you know, basically to the ecological limit. Yeah. And you got to a point where it was simply too dry and you couldn't go any more Makai. And that was the Makai level border of the Kalu'ulu. Um, in the northern extent, um, it's a little more ambiguous, but there's a pretty strong shift in soil properties along the upper boundary. And you know, my my thinking is essentially that on the upper boundary, you got to a point where you could do um, your more preferred annuals better. You know, so kalo, uh, uhi, yams, uh, uala, sweet potato. You know, um, you got to a point where those started cropping well, and you preferred those over breadfruit. So you're like, all right. It's enough breadfruit. We're gonna, you know, do kalo instead. Thank you. No, yeah. how many trees were in that belt approximately? Um, do I have that? I don't have that. Um, I would have to remind myself. Um, so we, you know, any. There's a good saying. I, I like the saying. Um, all models are wrong. Some are useful, <laughs> um, you know. So when we when we we did we modeled how many trees, how much productivity, uh, yada yada yada. But there is a lot of assumptions, right, that go into that modeling process, and so anything we produce is only at the end of the day, it's a reflection of those assumptions. Now they're an informed assumption, right? Like we we you know. Um, looked at all the old descriptions. We tried to get a sense of how well the trees were spaced. We tried to get a sense of how, what the turnover rate of trees was, you know, management styles, all of that. Um, and so, you know, I think it puts us in the ballpark, but, you know, I think anything where we're modeling, you know, modeling should always be taken with a grain of salt um, and and recognize that it's probably catching the broad sweeps, you know, the, the broad patterns. Um, but when you really drill into the details, like those assumptions get amplified. So, you know, a small, you know, like literally if we'd say the trees were spaced at, you know, 40 feet, versus 45 feet, right? Like a small difference in that assumption is gonna be like, oh, there was, you know, whatever, 100,000 versus, you know, 130,000 trees, like those things amplify. Um, I would have to like look at my notes to <laughs> um, understand, but um, it was on the order of uh, when we looked at production. Um, and so we, um, of remaining trees, we, we looked at different rainfalls, different lava flow ages, we monitored trees, we harvested all the fruit, we looked at yield, um, and then extrapolated all that. Um, in this belt alone, um, oh man, I want to say, I think it was 50,000 metric tons of breadfruit per year, um, which would be calorically on the order of being able to support 30,000 people if it was just breadfruit. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 3,000 calorie diet of breadfruit, that 50,000 metric tons could support about 30,000 people. And that was just a small part of the greater Kona system, right? As you went uphill, you had Kalo, Ulu, or Uwala, Uhi, bananas, sugarcane. You had, you know, the fish and all that. And then obviously breadfruit seasonal. So you're not eating all that breadfruit. Probably some of it was animal food. And then there's, you know, conversion. So, you know, it gets real complicated and, and complex really quick, but, um, but just to give a sense of the scale, you know, essentially, if this breadfruit belt was active, you could almost feed the, the modern Kona population with just this breadfruit belt. You know, that's, yeah, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and what you wanted in the past, right? Because that was it. <laughs> Right. Like the breadfruit belt wasn't it, but what you were producing was it. 
you know, there's no importing food in, when a drought year hits, right? You needed abundance above and beyond your population. Because if you didn't have that, if you were just walking the line and balancing population with food supply, when a bad year hits and food supply goes down, people starve, you know? And that's not, I don't think that was the society our ancestors were trying to build. Um, so I think there was a lot of buffer built into these systems. Um, and with the breadfruit specifically, I think a lot of that supported, um, for instance, pig husbandry, um, you know, and other animal husbandry um, supported a lot of like, you know, ceremonial celebration of abundance. So if you look at the breadfruit season, it aligns well with Makahiki season and like, hey, you know, everybody, yeah. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, I think there is there's that celebration that yes, we have this. We have this abundance. Worst comes to worst, we can all eat, you know, breadfruit and you know. Um no, would you please say the elevation range? Um, so it varies, um, as you can kind of see. So the lower edge, um, very closely follows the thousand millimeter contour line of rainfall. It's about 40 inches a year. And again, that varies from as low as, you know, maybe 500 foot elevation, uh, up to about 800. Um, the upper edge, um, and this is really interesting it almost perfectly mirrors the old Mama Lahoa Highway, like almost perfectly. And when, when I saw that and like kind of meditate, I don't meditate, but when I meditated on it, I was like, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you were to have a cross slope trail, you would want that trail in the shade <laughs> and having it right at the upper edge of the breadfruit belt. So you're still in the shade, but you have access to the more productive ag lands, Malka. I was like, that would make a lot of sense if there was a cross tropes, cross slope trail. And then our trails evolved right into cart trails and donkey trails and eventually our roads. Um, so we haven't found evidence for that. Um, that's just a, a thought, but, um, but yeah, the upper elevation is very, very, very close to the old Mamalohoa highway. So through Holualoa, um, up to, um, Makale. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, it rejoins the current highway south of, of Honalo and, um, Tashima's there. Uh, but yeah, that's basically the upper elevation limit. And it's not to say bread, they didn't grow breadfruit malka of that. It's just, it wasn't that core, like breadfruit forest, you know? Um, yeah. Good question. Ooh, we got back on this slow boat. <laughs> Anytime we're out of time, we can just call it and say, you did great, Noah. <laughs> Um, so we, we started looking at, at scaling up. Um, so our next project was looking at another really famous agroforestry system um, called the Pakukui. Uh, this was really famous in Puna, in Hamakua, and Kau. Um, and the essence of it was essentially that they grew fast growing, fast decomposing crops specifically to mulch them, um, to basically to cut them down and then grow your kalo. Um, so it's a very well documented. There's some beautiful writings in the new Pippa about, you know, they would dig these huge, like, you know, nine foot wide pits and they would just fill these pits with kukui mulch and then plant kalo in them. And they talk about the kalo growing in it, like being like nine feet tall and producing these huge, like 20 pound corms. Um, so it was another well documented system. Um, and, um, <laughs> The first, our first version, um, you know, we, we started using um, aerial imagery and I <laughs> hired a poor, poor undergrad <laughs> who literally went frame by frame along the Hamakua coast and like hand clicked on every kukui tree he could find, um, which turned out to be over 26,000 kukui trees. Um, but this is just an image uh, um, showing what he sees. And I mean, you can just see how the kukui really pops on the landscape, right? Because kukui has that little silvery hair and it reflects the light. 
in aerial imagery, Kukui just really, really stands out. So it was a really easy thing to map. Um, and so this was the result. Uh, the other thing we did, we, um, we hiked every river and rivulet from Hilo all the way up to uh, Waipio. Um, we hiked about 500 meters of, of every river and we mapped all the ulu trees that we found. And so this was the resulting map. All the yellow are the 26,000 kukui and then all the big green are the ulu trees. And the first thing that really stood out to us was when you look at the green, uh, you start from Hilo, there's plenty, 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 plenty. You get to Laupohoihoi, we didn't find a single ulu tree between Laupohoihoi and Waipio. We're not saying they didn't grow them there, we're just saying in our transects, we didn't pick up any. Um, and so that became kind of our basis for analysis, and we started looking at the distribution of kukui. And the gray didn't come up well here, but when you start to look at kukui, um, basically the kukui in the south where there was breadfruit and the kukui in the north where there was no breadfruit, there were big differences apparent. So right at that point where breadfruit drops off the landscape, kukui went from being cultivated up at like 750 meters down to like 300 meters. So a huge shift in the elevational range and when we look at um, soil fertility, we find that that point where breadfruit drops off corresponded to a place where the soils changed very dramatically. And in the south where you had uh, Ulu, you had pretty weak, you know, low soils. Um, you pass Laupohoihoi and your soil fertility uh, skyrockets all of a sudden. And the last thing was the socio-political stuff. So when you look at the distribution of Ulu, right where Ulu stops was at the Humuulu Ahupua'a. And Humuulu is the first Ahupua'a that goes all the way up to the summit of Mauna, Kea, or Mauna Loa. Um, it's weird, it kind of cuts across, it skirts the summit of Mauna Kea, goes across the saddle and up to the summit of Mauna Loa. Um, but essentially, Humuulu is the traditional boundary between Hilo and Hamakua. And the Pakukui was famous for Hamakua. Um, not the Hamakua coast, right? We talk about the Hamakua coast today, right? Everything like north of Hilo to Waipio is, oh, that's Hamakua coast. But when you look at the Moku, Hamakua didn't start until that Humuulu Ahupua'a in the Laupohoihoi area. And so all these things were aligning, right? This shift in the distribution of Kukui, the shift in soil properties and the, the socio-political divisions all aligned uh, um, right at this point where we see essentially what looks like a shift in the cropping pattern um, with Ulu or no Ulu. Um, so to us, this said that the, the Kukui, even though Hamakua is extremely disturbed, right, with the history of the sugar plantations. Um, and even though it's been 150 years, it does seem that these trees are preserving a footprint, you know, preserving a glimpse into um, what our ancestors were doing on the landscape uh, 200 years ago. Um, so we decided to scale it up. Um, now we used uh, computer sensing and um, uh, uh, we didn't have an intern look at the whole state and click on every, <laughs> every tree. Um, yeah. But yeah, we used the uh, World 3 data and kind of used a, a, a computer derived maximum likelihood classification. Um, and through that, we're able to map Kukui across the state. Um, which in itself was fascinating. Um, Kukui is a huge component of, of most of our forest ecosystems. Um, it's not studied that well, but um, it has a very, very wide distribution. Uh, this is the Kukui canopy just on Maui alone in the bright pink. Um, and that's the same slide I just had for, you know, probably an error. Um, we saw this, oh. Um, Wow, we are running way late. 
Um, bottom line is that uh, we saw a lot of patterns um, when we looked at the state level, we saw a lot of patterns that again suggested Kukui is actually an accurate indicator of where our ancestors were doing agroforestry. Um, so when we look at the historical analysis, we looked at um, aerial photos that go back to the 1940s. And then there's 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. For some reason, there's a big gap. And then there's like 2012 and then 2020. Um, when we look at that, Kukui has been declining statewide. Um, so a lot of people talk about Kukui being invasive, about spreading out. We're seeing the opposite. Um, and actually, uh, total Kukui canopy has declined um, about 9% per decade over the at least the last 70 years. So we're like, you know, this argument that Kukui is spreading out is BS. It's actually contracting. And so Kukui is not an overestimation of our ancestors planting of it. It's an underestimation. It's it's declining. Yeah. I think there's going to be overall canopy decline though. And it wouldn't surprise me if Kukui were outpacing that because I don't know, my neighbors have it. It's all over my yard. Mm. You know, it's a it is a really actively growing plant. It is in disturbed open habitats. Yeah. So yeah, that is a, a I would say a caveat so that in um we did see some areas of expansion and in particular, like abandoned cattle fields were a great example. You know, areas that were cleared and non-forested and then abandoned, Kukui spread very rapidly and, and grew. But particularly when we look at remote areas, so like Wailao Valley on the North shore of Molokai, you know, which is probably one of the least human impacted areas in the state, um, you know, there even we saw a very consistent and considerable decline in, in Kukui canopy. Um, it could be... other canopy though? Well, total canopy is not decreased. It was 100% in 1940 and it's 100% now. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, there's nobody there. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I mean, there are caveats and, and that's good, I think, yeah, to, to bring those up and, 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 um, and question this stuff, right? Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, other things we saw that when we did um, habitat modeling of Kukui and where Kukui can grow, um, we did see that Kukui has not filled out its ecological niche. Um, so there's massive areas in Puna, in Hana, on Maui that are prime Kukui habitat. Kukui would thrive, but there's no Kukui there. And our argument was, well, it's because our ancestors didn't plant it there. It's not this massive invasive species that spread out everywhere, um, but it was limited to areas it, it has um, uh, been established. Question. Yes. So I was just on the Hamakua Coast today up in the eucalyptus monoculture areas, mm -hmm. wondering if that Kukui would, would do well in that area if we were to remove it and start a reforestation project all along there. That was a prime pa kukui yeah yeah and do you know um noyel peralta uh hui mao okay so they um he's an awesome guy uh we were um he was doing his undergrad at stanford when i was getting my phd there um but he really looked at that history of that hamakua area and they now have um 1500 acres in kohola lele uh just south of paowilo um where they are restored cutting down the eucalyptus and restoring um, the kind of traditional agroforestry systems. But he has spent a lot of time in the archives and has found some amazing pictures of that Hamakua coast, the eucalyptus zone um, from the early 1900s, you know, 1903, 1904, 1905, that just show it as this Kukui forest, you know, um, so absolutely. And, you know, even though the Kukui is all along um, the flat areas, all along the sugar lands, even in those eucalyptus plantations, if you go to the little rivers and rivulets where they couldn't bulldoze it flat, you'll find Kukui and Ulu and even occasionally like yams growing still in those little rivers and rivulets, um, kind of indicating what was there, yeah, in the past. Um, but absolutely, Kukui would do great. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Whew. Not the half hour talk you guys asked me to do. Um, anyway, um, we've taken all this information. Um, you know, again, because Hawaii has these beautifully organized gradients, uh, we are able to kind of model those distributions, um, both of kind of more intensive forms of agroforestry, things like the Pakukui and the Kaluulu, um, as well as, as these less intensive forms of kind of novel forest conversion. Um, and um, we can combine those with a lot of the other existing models. Um, so the dry land and wetland systems from Thane, the colluvial slope systems from Natalie, um, you know, our agroforestry systems. Um, we've also been working on this kind of more marginal um, dry land uh, uh, cultivation. Um, but one of the, the big take homes that, that I want to make is um, one that just like the rest of the Pacific, agroforestry, forestry management was, a, was the dominant um, form of our traditional land cultivation. Um, so about 50% of the total conversion of land was into agroforestry. Um, and the other thing, um, oh, this is even outdated. Sorry, I just copied and pasted this. But when we start adding all these things up, um, the Hawaiian footprint on the landscape starts to look closer to like 30% of the landscape. And I think that's really, really important because the narrative we're always talking about is that Hawaiians lived lightly on the landscape, right? They, they only converted like 10% of the land and they provided for all the people and they, you know, had this beautiful, you know, ecological harmony and they, and I think that's BS. Like, I think our ancestors, did, they didn't live lightly. They lived intelligently on the landscape. The way that they made these conversions, and the conversions were extensive. You know, when you look at how much of the landscape they, they converted to, to support their society, it was a big area. But they did do that in a way that maintained a lot of that ecological integrity. You know, by using systems like agroforestry, where you are maintaining the ecosystem services of that production, right? And where you situated it was really important, you know? So like the Kalaulu of Kona was downslope from their intensive Kalo production. And that agroforestry system could do things like prevent flooding and do soil capture and like, you know, help purify the water on its way down to, you know, the nearshore environment. And I just think that's a big shift in the narrative from like walking lightly to walking intelligently. And especially is, is relevant today when, you know, just the amount of people on the planet, right? We can't walk lightly anymore. There's too many people to walk lightly on this planet. We have to walk intelligently and smartly in, in the way we do our developments. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there. So I'll just jump to that slide. All right. Mahalo. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> and so, yeah, still very happy to, to discuss or have questions or comments or anything. I have a question. Uh -huh. In your place where you're creating your new food uh, band, uh -huh. could you make it more of like a food forest and, and increase like the understory stuff that goes underneath it? Oh, no, no. It definitely is. Yeah. So both in the past and what we're doing, it is... Um, certainly a heavily diversified yeah multi-story agroforestry okay, cool. and yeah you see that in the traditional writings they um several descriptions of that breadfruit zone one is they talk about it um the trees being very well spread out so that the canopies aren't touching and they contrast this really heavily against the food forest of the south pacific where it's basically a closed canopy forest of breadfruit and mountain apple and, and the Tahitian chestnut and stuff. So it's a pretty dark understory and a relatively open understory. Um, in the, the Kona system, they talk a lot about, again, the trees being spread out, the trees being relatively short, 
and then the extremely diverse production around the trees. You know, so things like Valke paper mulberry, which was used for kappa production, um, uh, ava, you know, my, uh, the bananas. Um, and so you had this, yeah, high light penetration, um, but you had the nutrient cycling from the trees, you had the mulch from the trees that supported um, this kind of microhabitat development for a whole range of other crops. So like on our farm, you know, for instance, everyone's like, oh, you guys are too dry to do um, kalo where you're at well without irrigation. Um, but what we found is that you know, so we'll have a ulu tree, and again, it's well spaced, so it's like a ulu tree gap ulu tree, and right on the drip line of the ulu tree, you know, the rainfall gets concentrated and it all drips down, and so we have this super productive like taro ring around every one of our ulu trees. Um, you know, so, and then when you look at like the rhizome crops, like the avapuhi, the shampoo ginger loves it under the ulu tree where it's full shade and cool and dark. And then when you come into the light gap area, like olena, the turmeric does really, really well. So they're both rhizomous crops. They kind of serve the same function of, you know, closing up that ground surface and preventing weeds and being productive, but they op uh, occupy different microhabitats within that that system um so yeah so our farm we do um banana uh ava olena pia avapuhi um fair bit of noni and then our canopy is like mountain apple uh ulu kukui um lots of tea leaf around and stuff like that but yeah, but absolutely, it's not an orchard system, and it wasn't the orchard system in the past. It was kind of a, a managed forest um, type of, of system. What space yeah. do you uh, have for your food? Um, so there, it's highly variable. <laughs> and when we started, man, like, you know, we're on a KS lease, um, and it had been fallow for like 30 years. It was the neighborhood dump. <laughs> so step one was like hauling out like 30 pickup trucks full of trash to, you know, anyway. Um, uh, but when we, when we got it, it was basically, a uh, invasive forest. It was all African tulip, you know, wild avocado, um, fair bit of Guinea grass and some understory stuff. So our approach was to like go cut trails through everything and then plant along the trails. And then as the trees were growing on the trails, we'd slowly keep clearing around the trees and eventually, so we didn't like clear it and open it up because then your guinea grass just goes crazy and you get all your annual weeds. We kind of did this transition from one forest to another, you know, an invasive African tulip forest to a breadfruit forest. Um, but because of that method and kind of cutting the trail, sometimes it was hard to see how far you were. Things felt a lot farther, right? When you're hacking through, you're like, oh, that's 50 feet, yeah. But we were aiming for about like 50 feet. Um, and that was because, you know, based on, on the descriptions of the system written in European journals and written by Hawaiians in the new paper, like that's um, what we thought, right, was happening there. Um, so we were essentially trying to recreate, right, what was, um, was there, you know, both for kind of awareness and, and having a reference system, you know, so I grew up in our public school systems, you know, and I was born in Kona, was raised in Kula on Maui. And then you get to fourth grade, right, and they have the Hawaiian studies module at, at DOE schools and they pull up the Ahupua'a poster, right? And they're like, this is Ahupua'a. It's like a valley ridges with a stream coming down the middle. And you're like, I've never seen a stream in my life. Like, There's no streams in Kona, there's no streams in Kula. So, you know, for us, I think it's really important for, for you know, especially Hawaiian kids growing up in Kona to be able to see like, hey, this, is actually what your ancestors were doing, right? This would be a reference off Upua'a in Kona, you know, not this, you know, idyllic river valley with lo'i systems and this and this. Um, so, you know, I mean, with my other hat as a researcher, right, like we also wanted to study this stuff. 
um, and there's none existing. <laughs> so you can't study it if the, you don't have the system to study. Um, so, you know, in concert with kind of restoring it, we've also been doing all the science, right? Been looking at things like, you know, nutrient cycling and, and you know, soil development and carbon sequestration and cycling. And, um, you know, so, yeah, kind of um, paralleling the science side of what we're doing with also the, the kind of applied um, restoration side. Awesome. Yeah. What was the importance of cocoina in the diet? You know, so the um, one of my colleagues, Kavika Winters, um, and we like talk about this stuff sometimes. Um, anyway, he is convinced that kukui was introduced as a mulch. Oh. <laughs> you know, so kukui played, it was a tremendous resource crop, right? Like it played a lot of roles. Um, obviously the nuts are, are extremely oily. So the main fuel source of old Hawaii was kukui. Um, and when you read like old descriptions of, of the usage of kukui oil, I mean, they talk about oiling the canoes every single time they went in the water. You know, they talk about oiling the body daily. They talk about, you know, um, you know, oiling the kappa because it makes it softer and more pliable and, you know, it doesn't chafe you when you're out there working. Um, and so when we did this pakukui paper, you know, we just made a back of the envelope calculation. Like, okay, we know kukui produces like, 200 pounds of nuts a year, that equals X amount of, of oil, right? If, if every human in old Hawaii, when we, you know, the population was whatever, 400,000, and every person needed like four ounces of kukui oil every day, right? To oil the canoe and their body and their kappa and like light stuff at night. Um, it translates to something like, you know, 15 to 20,000 hectares of kukui just to produce that oil need. But it's not consumed, right? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, as medicine, as a garnish. Uh -huh. Yeah, so as a food source, no. Food source. But they also talk about the pa kukui um, has a very strong association with kamopua'a. And the pigs, just like they love macadamia nuts, oh, yeah. pigs love kukui nuts. So as a, a animal fodder too, kukui probably played a key role in managing um, pig production. Um, but yeah, as a human food, um, you could virtually ignore it in terms of the diet, yeah. Um, yeah, we always grew up calling it the one, two, three nut because like, you know, if you eat three of them, you gotta <laughs> run. <laughs> um, yeah, so in medicine, it's used as a purgative, right? Like it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you don't wanna eat too much of it. Um, but we've been doing some studies with, with mulch, right? Because especially in our young landscapes like Puna, um, kalo and sweet potato cultivation were like exclusively in mulch. You know, so you have these pohoi hoi flows, and in the divots of the pohoi hoi, they would mulch, hala, how, kukui, and grow crops. And so we did, you know, really, actually, as a student of mine, um, did some really simple experiments where we got big, you know, 100 gallon drums, and we like filled them with how, and kukui, and sugarcane, and ulu, and, you know, all these different mulch sources and just grew kalo in the pure mulch. And, you know, we did all the biogeochemistry, right? We looked at nutrient availability and nitrogen fixation and, you know, nutrient gain and loss. And kukui had nothing exceptional about it chemically. Like when we looked at the nutrients and all of that, it was, it was almost indistinguishable from how, um, which was another favored mulch source, but the kalo in the kukui were like twice the size and twice the yields of anything else. And chemically, we can like have no explanation. You know, it's possible it's microbial or, or some other factors, you know, but, um, but it does seem like there is this really strong synergy between kukui and these, these tuber crops and kalo in particular. And so, yeah, so Kavika is like, no, they just brought it 
for the mulch like that's like they literally brought it because it you didn't have fertilizer back then right, right? like nutrient management yeah. in ag is is essential yeah. um you know it's a fundamental thing about ag you know when you harvest food you're removing nutrients from that system and over time unless you're replacing them like it's gonna fail and the human history is littered with examples of failed ag because the nutrient management you know not over 20 years but over centuries and stuff right like those things fail um, so yeah, so nutrient management was key and to think that our ancestors weren't aware of that and managing that I think is foolish because you know their lives depended on it. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's a theory. No, yeah, no stops. Yeah. Um, so I think your work is absolutely fascinating. Scratches my exact itch of nerd, like an ecologist <laughs> and an anthropologist, and so it's fascinating. But I also think it's important to kind of take this information and put it into the context of the modern day. And we very much need to start feeding ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. What What are your thoughts on how we can take this information, bring it into the modern day? And Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, again, started the talk by kind of talking about different hats and came here with the researcher hat, but like that is only half of what we do. And the other half is very strongly working to, to you know, improve our contemporary food system. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think the low hanging fruits um, are that distributional stuff, right? So um doing the right form of agriculture where it belongs i think is a huge part of the puzzle um, and in particular recognizing that agroforestry and tree agriculture um, have a tremendous role to play in ecosystem management um, as well as food production um, so, you know, my, um, we, we formed, founded and formed the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative, um, which now my wife manages. Um, we've grown from nine farmers now to about 130 farmers, started on the big island. We're on three islands now. Actually, we're just signing up our first Kauai members. Um, but, you know, promoting and, and implementing um, tree-based agriculture, I think, is one of the lowest hanging fruits that's right there, that's easy to do, that has tremendous impact. Um, so, I mean, we've really taken to calling ulu um, a solutionary food um, because it's the, the revolutionary solution. That, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, when you look at our food system, right, there's multiple issues, right? I mean, there's, there's the environmental and ecological impact of our food production. There's declining um, nutrition and nutritional density of our foods. There is um, obviously social and justice issues in terms of, of food access and equity. Um, and breadfruit is like, I mean, it's such a low hanging fruit that addresses all of those components. You know, as a long lived tree, you know, you don't need to till, you're sequestering carbon, you have improved nutrient and water use efficiency, and they're still on par with industrial wheat and corn production when you look at a per acreage um, uh, food value. You know, breadfruit is an extremely productive tree and it's a staple, mm -hmm. right? It's one of the few carbohydrate um, rich foods that grow on a tree. Um, and then because it is still a fruit, it has relatively high vitamin and mineral density. So it falls, uh, uh, solves a lot of that nutritional issues. Um, and then again, with the social injustice thing, like, you know, not everybody can go and be a farmer, but you can literally plant the tree in your backyard and like solve half of your family's, you know, carbohydrate needs. Um, so there's, you know, just, it's, it's to me, like that's the low hanging fruit. And that's really one of the areas we're really pushing on um, is kind of agroforestry and breadfruit agroforestry in particular as just a, a, a tremendous, again, low hanging um, solution. So can we um, grow uh, breadfruit here? Right here? Like a lot. Woo! 
<laughs> um, with irrigation, yes. <laughs> The wind, like the, the big leaves. Uh huh. Kind of like they're not. The they're they yeah. They have a bad rap for for wind, but uh -huh. um, you know, as we've worked with farmers across the state, and we have these statewide variety trials, including a trial in in Ho'olehua in Molokai, which is like howling winds every day. Um, you know, they're they're actually quite wind tolerant. Mm -hmm. I think the bad rap of Ulu in the wind is that. Nobody's maintaining their trees, right? But if you plant it and you maintain it and you prune it and you keep it right 15, 20 feet high, which you don't want it higher than that because you ain't reaching up there, right? Um, they're actually pretty wind tolerant um, as a whole. You know, it's a very flexible tree. Uh, it's a very soft, light wood, but with a really, really um, uh, thick and fibrous inner bark. Um, and so it flexes a lot, so it, it takes the wind pretty well. Um, you know, you can get a little wind burn on the tree, um, but um, but overall, as a whole, it's not like this. Like, um, I don't think it warrants the bad wind wrap that that Ulu has as a whole. Um, you know, the, it is a true tropical tree, right? It originates in Borneo, Papua New Guinea, um, you know, and, and Hawaii, although we always call it Hawaii tropical, we are subtropical. Um, so Ulu does thrive near the coast in Hawaii. You can come uphill quite a bit, but, you know, like it won't grow in Waimea, for instance, or it'll grow, but not, yeah, it'll grow, but not fruit. Or if you fruit, you'll get like little, like you can pickle them, you know, <laughs> um, and Ulu makes great pickles. Um, yeah, we have a cold elevation site on Maui up in Kula and the trees are, they're fruiting uh, for the first time this year. It's actually just over there uh, on Tuesday um, and they're fruiting heavily. But they're like the cutest little <laughs> things I've ever seen. It was so funny because they sent me pictures and they sent them really close up. And I'm like, oh, they look awesome. They look great. And then I go over there and they're like, you know, like literally like baseball size. So it's like, oh, those are cute. Um, <laughs> but, you know, still edible. And, you know, yeah, it's not like, you know, can't do anything with them. That one rainfall contour that belt was on, rainfall line with that. So it's um, about 40 inches. Yeah, a thousand millimeters. Uh, I've got a little cakey in Kauai High. Oh, okay. Irrigate, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 40 inches. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, so, I mean, they did grow. So two things I'd say to that. One, um... In all our modeling, one of the forms of agriculture I know we're missing because they're they're well documented and they, they clearly don't show up on all those models is places where um, trees tap into the groundwater table. So Lahaina on Maui, famous for its breadfruit grove. When you look at the rainfall, it's way too dry for breadfruit, way too dry. I mean, it's close to Kauai High. It's a little wetter than Kauai High, but not a lot. Um, it's like maybe as wet as like Anaiho Omalu or, or um, what's the harbor up, uh, up going Kohala. Um, the old one, the Mahukona. Yeah, it's about that wetness. It's pretty dry in Lahaina, but... Um, there were lots of springs and seepage, and so the ulu there, I think, was tapping into the groundwater table. The other thing is ulu, um, there's a couple of publications out there that, that say it, but that they claim ulu is not very salt tolerant. Um, so we've done two things. Um, one, we, we, we've been doing a nutrient deficiency trial um, just to document nutrient deficiencies. But as part of that, we did one treatment that was a salt toxicity. And we just basically pour salt water on the tree, you know, every time we fertilize it. And they're doing better <laughs> than the control. Um, and also we have, again, this statewide variety trial. One of our sites is in a sea spray zone in, in um, Pepeekeo, right on the coast, you know, constantly bathed in sea spray. It's our most productive site across this, the state. Um, so I think, you know, actually Ulu not only 
tolerates, but you know, appreciates uh, um, some some salt in its diet. Um, yeah, yeah. But if in Kauai High, I mean, Kauai High is really dry. But you know, if you're right down by the water there, you know, and and um, you know, like just north of the harbor, there is a ulu tree there, um, and there's kind of like a. a like there's a greener patch of Kiave um, just north of the, like right, right, right north of the harbor um, past like the gas station. Yeah, yeah. No, not even up to Kalaiopua. Like you, you, you know, and you go and then you take the road to Kohala and there's the gas station and the, the little thing, like literally neighboring, neighboring the, the little restaurants right. area. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's, there's an area and the, the, the Kiave are a little greener and then there's a ulu tree in there. And I think there, they're tapping into the water table. Um, that's my thought, you know, but. Anyway, that's that's something that you know. I'll let you know in, a ten, in ten years. Or okay, yeah. <laughs> nice. There's some beautiful ulu trees at Kalahuikua mm -hmm. down there. So, is that? I mean, I don't know. Maybe it could be. Yeah. It could be out there. Absolutely. That would be uh -huh. water. And yeah, yeah. And I mean, you just look at Google Maps and you can see the areas, right? Like when you look at Kol uh, not Koloko. Um, Oh, it's the big fish pond up there. Um, just south of Anaihoomalu, um, Ki yeah, Kiholo. You know, when you look at Kiholo in Google Maps, you see this huge triangle of like green kukui, like coming up, and then you go north, south, or Mauka, and it drops off. And like to me, like that's just a clear indicator of like where the the water tables come up near the surface. The Kiave is tapping that, and then obviously you have Kiholo, where all the freshwater springs are coming out right Makai of there. Um, so you can see some of these patterns, like just looking at you know satellite you know imagery of our islands and stuff. And um, yeah, yeah. You, you started your talk about the uh, the evolution of the fish. <laughs> yeah, the diverse bird population on the island that's radically different just in the short distance. Mm -hmm. Why why on Hawaii do we see such wide ecological and um, just overall uh, evolutionary changes with things like birds, but not really the same with our forests? Mm. Why have it are are we just too young of an island and Trees like why hasn't adapted better to like Waimea climate? Uh huh. Well, so I mean, the Polynesian introduced ones that's way too short. Um, so things like Ulu and Kukui, but I mean, in terms of our native plants, um, so two things I'd say. Um, one, there are some species that did. Right. So if you look at Bidens, for instance, um, or our lobeliads, um, the bellflower family, like they did do that speciation. You know, even our, our, um, prochardias, our, our fan palms did. Um, you know, we've lost a tremendous amount of them, but there was, you know, 30 something species of prochardia. There was like 50 plus species of, of bellflower, you know, uh, lobelioids and, you know, Biden's diversified into like high twenties or something. So some plant species did. And I mean, you know, I'm not an evolutionary, you know, biologist, but my guess is that those species were earlier introductions, you know, than some of our others. Um, you know, and then you also have some weird phenomena, right? Like, like Ohia, like Metrosideros um, polymorpha, like it's very rare for a single species to occupy the range of habitats that that Ohia does. And I don't have the, you know, um, knowledge or vocabulary to, um, uh, you know, express my thoughts on that. But, um, you know, something's clearly going on there where, um, um, but yeah, you know, I know Hawaii has, uh, I always get them confused. Uh, I used to be in conservation biology a long time ago, but I think we have high 
high alpha and low beta diversity. Is that it? Maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, I'm <laughs> getting out of my depth here. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I would say some species did, but in general, you're right, you know, that a lot of our plant species did not. And, and I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. All right. That's a great time to end. All right. Yeah. <laughs>